Good morning, folks. This is John Kogan. I'm the CEO of Performative, the online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. First, I'd like to welcome everyone to this morning's webinar entitled Budgeting and Forecasting Best Practices. Budgeting and forecasting are perennial top issues for CFOs and finance professionals everywhere. In this webinar, Barry Wilderman, Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research Group, will spend time identifying best practices and people, processes, and technology which can be applied to companies of virtually any size and across industries. We will also hear from David Morrison, Director of Financial Planning and Treasurer at the Port of Tacoma, who will discuss some of the real-world forecasting issues he has had and how he has overcome them. We're looking forward to hearing from them, and we thank everyone for joining us this morning. I would also like to thank Propix for helping us make this event possible. Like everything that we do at Performative, this event is delivered at no cost uh, to our members, and uh, it's folks like Propix who allow us to do that. So a great thanks to, uh, to the folks at Propix. Quick note on today's agenda. First, we will hear presentations from the two speakers. And then we will move to a panel discussion where we will spend the remainder of our hour. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you. So if you have questions at any time, please go to the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get all of them in, but we will do our best. And we'll also do our best to follow up afterwards on any questions we don't get to. After this event, we will send out a link to the soft copy of this presentation to all attendees. Uh, in fact, it is already posted on the performative site and uh, available for folks who want to download it. And of course, that's free. Um, we are also offering CPE credits for the CPAs in today's audience. Now, to do that, we need to ask two poll questions during today's event. So uh, keep your heads up uh, for those. We'll be asking those questions after each of the two presentations. Uh, so we'll take a brief pause after each of those presentations, ask our polling questions, and then we'll move on. Um, these are, uh, are not comprehension tests or memorization tests, so you don't have to worry about memorizing every uh, iota of the presentations in order to take those polls. And even if you're not here for CPE credit, uh, we'd love to have your input on these polls. They're statistical questions. They're interesting for us to actually revisit during the Q&A section. Uh, so we'd love you to participate. Um, if you have any questions at all about CPE credits, uh, then please email Tanya Walsh. And her email is twalsh at performative.com. And we'll show her email address later. Now a quick word about Performative. For those of you uh, who are new to Performative, uh, this might be your first event. We are the largest and fastest growing online resource for senior corporate finance professionals and related professionals, treasury, accounting, internal audit, etc. We're a completely ad-free and noise-free community. We're actually over half a million folks now, uh, CFOs, controllers, treasurers, all levels. Um, and it's a really interesting resource. People ask questions, and their peers answer their questions. Um, it's a wonderful resource to have, and uh, it's completely free and noise-free. So please check it out at performative.com if you haven't already. And with that, what I'd love to do is introduce our first speaker. His name is Barry Wilderman. He is Vice President and Principal Analyst with Constellation Research Group. He's focused on enterprise performance management, EPM. And he has over 30 years of experience as an industry analyst, researcher, and consultant. Prior to joining Constellation, Barry spent 10 years at Meta Group, which is now a part of Gartner Group, uh, managing a team in the area of business applications. Uh, Barry has been widely recognized as a thought leader in the space. Um, he has routinely provided strategic advice to C-level executives at companies like SAP, Oracle, and IBM. He is also a frequent keynote speaker at major conferences. Barry holds a BS degree from City College of New York and MS degrees from Brown University and NYU. And with that, Barry, I'd love to uh, invite you to take it away. Thank you, John. And hello, everybody. I'm. Um I'm very pleased to be here and uh, spend some time with you. Let's go to the first slide. So I'm going to be talking about budgeting and forecasting and, and strategic um, planning, strategic management. Uh, we're going to move to the next slide and now start with uh, budgeting. Uh, and as we do that, I'll get to the others. 
And, and the real question about budgeting, I think, is you know I, I always I always believe that people are indifferent about working on budgeting and having root canal, but it really need not be that way. It shouldn't be that way. And the real issue, I think, is is what I I'll, I'll call goal oriented budgeting. And we'll talk more about best practices later. But how does budgeting impact the bottom line? <clears throat> you all should know that. How do you know uh, when you've got a great budget? How do you know when it's done? Um, how does management motivate the budgeting process and the people uh, that work in the budgeting process? <coughs> Excuse me. How does uh, the budget impact it by key drivers? Uh, Driver-based planning is a major force in forecasting these days. And how should incentives be provided? And so to me, uh, and I hope to you, strategic budgeting is not an oxymoron. Uh, but real and should be goal-centered, and we'll look more about that as we as we proceed through the presentation. Uh, but but first, um, one of my favorite cartoons. I was looking for something that kind of breaks the tension here a bit. At our last meeting, we decided to go for broke. Well, mission accomplished. Well, maybe that's not such a good thing, but at least they had a mission. They accomplished it. Maybe they ran a business. But I think the point of this is is uh, to have a real mission and, and to go for that mission uh, along the way. Uh, and so as we move uh, on beyond that and kind of look at the, uh, the budget cycle, you know, clearly uh, everybody does budgeting in a variety of ways. There's a lot of Excel in that. Uh, but at, at its heart, you know, budgeting is a 12-month plan for how to run the business. Or maybe it's, it's more than a 12-month plan. And maybe you're using rolling forecasts to drive yourself forward from a traditional budget. And, and as you do that, that brings up you know, different issues. And so the, the periods are important. Uh, the extension of the periods are important. But at the end of the day, it's all about how the budget impacts uh, the organization. And we'll see this again and again as we look at, at forecasting uh, <clears throat> and we look at strategy as well. So let's move on to the next uh, slide. Some of the things that may or may not be uh, on your on your checklist, you know, some vendors provide web-based data entry. I like that. You can wind up in Excel hell pretty easily. Uh, whatever you do, you need a way to kind of bound the problem, uh, to keep track of, of the different um, people entering data, how the data is, is put together. Uh, some vendors offer cloud solution. Um, that could be good. Or if you're doing it inside the firewall and can manage it successfully, that's OK, too. Um, but these, these solutions should provide reporting uh, and graphics and scorecards <clears throat> and dashboards all. So the variety and, and complexity of different outputs is important uh, across all of this. Then you need to worry about interoperability to ERP, one of my favorite subjects, enterprise resource planning and other action systems. So if you have different systems for discounting, um, uh, for payables, uh, for, for asset management, uh, it all matters toward putting the budget together. And, and the ability to, as you go through a checklist, to feed data into the budget automatically, to aggregate data from feeder sources, to create different aggregates matters. You need to keep track of that. You need to also track you know, budget submissions. Where are they coming from? Who's doing the budget? What are the revisions? How often uh, are you going to go through this cycle until you, you know, call a halt uh, to this and, and call it a day and then begin to go through a, a management review uh, of the budget process? And you also then need to provide forecasting uh, as well. And we'll look at forecasting in a little bit of detail uh, today uh, as we go through this presentation in, in part two of three as we look at, at forecasting. So some of the major software checklist items you know, to be concerned about. And then, OK, so now I'm going to move on to forecasting and go down to the next uh, slide. How do you run your company you know, on current budgets you know, versus new forecasts? And this is an important question. If you're going to say, OK, we're only going to rely on a budget for the next six months or three months, and then we're going to forecast again, the style at which you do that is critical. Um, because what you're basically doing is throwing out the endpoints of the budget because you're willing to uh, rebuild them, which I think is a great idea, as long as it doesn't impact the overall plan of the company. 
if the plan of the company involves, you know, capital budgeting, maybe it's not so good, but if it involves, you know, basically planning for the cafeteria, maybe that's okay. You need to decide how you can live with that. Similarly, how does the forecast process improve the bottom line and, and make your company better? And then finally, how can you uh, deploy um, uh, drivers and, and rolling forecasts uh, in order to successfully manage your business? And so, we look at forecasts in a little more detail. This, this you know, diagram basically is very simple, meant to be. Analysis of revenue, it says, gee, well, this company had a initial budget, January, February, March. Um, they you know, recorded actuals against it. And then using a rolling forecast, probably, they decided to you know, rebuild the um, original budget and to, um, to change it with a high level of optimism here. Uh, Actually, no, they, they actually tried to, they did a revised forecast for April, May, June, reflecting um, lower numbers in step three. I had it backwards, sorry about that, as opposed to reading the budget. And so this is a perfectly fine technique, as long as it's generally known in the organization how many periods out will be the budget, how many periods out will be the revised forecast, how will you forecast, and how do you intend to run the business based upon the revision and the forecast, not just the original numbers, but if you're going to reforecast, then it's implicitly true that you're only going to run the business uh, for the first three months because new numbers are coming. And, and if you can bear those new numbers coming, then you can go ahead and you can go ahead and run the business uh, based upon those new numbers. And so it's a bit of a, a bit tricky here. A good way to run a, run a company, but again, you've got to you know tie it in to your goals, to your overall uh, planning approach. So as we move to the next slide and look at the variety of different forecasts, you, know, you have a lot of different techniques at your fingertips. Many people use rolling forecasts and use the technique to roll the forecast for the next n months based upon number of months before that. Um, I'm a particular fan of driver-based planning, and so rather than you know forecast everything in sight, if I'm a you know trucking company, say, um, <clears throat> I want to do a rolling forecast based upon driver utilization, based upon pallets, based upon customer satisfaction, and I can then shrink my overall budget process by reducing the number of lines doing a more aggregate analysis, running a driver-based plan, the forecasting based upon that. And so if you come back to the original premise of goals, and you come back to the idea of being goal-centered, then the reduction of the raw number of lines in the budget suggests more visibility. Uh, and more visibility allows you then to take those rows that matter and use them on a driver-based um, approach uh, to move the data forward. And of course, you can do <clears throat> other techniques like moving averages, time series analysis, or even regressions. And so, so if you, you know, wish to be more scientific, which isn't always better, it's just different. Then, as long as you know that these techniques have value, and you want to run regressions, say, to to do a forecast going forward, no problem. And and I'd say, you know, have at it. <clears throat> so. Let me kind of sum up this area um, in budgeting and forecasting, and I'll spend the next five minutes or so talking about, about um, strategy. <clears throat> Publish clear goals. This is so important. Publish clear goals. I can't emphasize this enough. So many budgets are just rote, but the indication of clear goals, management involvement uh, is key. Use drivers. Uh, create a calendar for budget delivery. Budgeting may not be a pleasant process, but it needs to be highly orchestrated and managed or else it won't work. And assign accountability at the unit and group level uh, in order to make sure that you get it right. And with all those things, uh, budgeting, um, I think, you know, becomes more of a, of a good exercise to go through. Um, you know, I can't guarantee you that it will always uh, be fun. Our last few items, driver base we talked about, rolling forecasts, also useful, point two to influence change, and then creating playbooks to analyze your budget to various as a forecast. So you need a set of methodologies and techniques, not just to set goals, but to, to orchestrate 
the rules for looking at the budgets, looking at the variances, uh, creating rolling forecasts, etc., uh, to bring all the pieces together. And if you do that, I think you'll hopefully you'll have a, a, a more pleasant uh, experience. So, strategy. 70% um, of all strategies fail. It's a, nor it's a horrifying number to me, and, and again, I think that doesn't need that to be the case. Strategy should start out with a notion of mission, values, vision, an idea of what you can do to sustain competitive advantage. Then you should develop goals, goals being the projects you're going to do um, that are tied to KPIs, K performance indicators, tied to targets. Um, now, when you assign teams to meet these goals, it's not always the case that team members are happy about it, particularly if they have a day job, and families, of course. But you need to make sure that these teams have time to work. You need to make sure that the teams have a power to execute, and you need to create clear accountability. Strategy formulation is generally a winner. Strategy execution is generally a loser. So it's on the back end that we get into, into real trouble. I hope I can point out a few things that may help you uh, along the way. So uh, you should be measuring progress uh, on goals. You should be deploying real project management for complex goals. This is, this is one of my, uh, my major contentions in life about projects in general. Um, Strategy involves um, projects. Projects involve people. Uh, project management based upon percent complete uh, generally is not good enough. Um, the expression that I love about percent complete, and you probably like this as well, says that the first 90% of a project goes much faster than the last 90% of the project. So what should you do? Um, I'm a big fan of earned value, and the earned value approach basically says if you're doing a task, there's no percent complete, there's no discussion. When you complete a task, there's a deliverable, that deliverable has value, you earn that value, and the earned value is used to then complete the overall project. And you need to track completed goals uh, as they go live. And now, Another key here to, to budgeting and forecasting and why I included strategy management in all of this, I'll make a few points. Strategy needs to be tied to budgets. If you're doing a strategy, <clears throat> then year one of the strategy is the, is the budget, right? The working capital that I need to build that factory year one goes in the budget. Um, moreover, um, there's also a whole lot of discussion going on. I'll just point it out to you. I'd love to talk to you more about it. The notion of integrated business planning integrated business planning, and what that says is that you also need to tie, and this is also true of the budget and forecast, a cash plan, a working capital plan, an operating plan, a sales plan, all together uh, into, into a uniform whole. Uh, and, and by doing that, then you've, you've completed the circle and, and made strategy real tied to goals, made budgeting real tied to goals, and those three bubbles matter, strategy, budgeting, and forecasting, and, and bring you to uh, an overall uh, endpoint that, that matters. So thank you for listening. I hope to talk with you later and answer some questions. I'll turn it back to John. And I'm sure we'll get into uh, some of the nitty-gritty details also when we, uh, when we get into this uh, a little later in the Q&A section. And uh, that's actually a, a great uh, segue reminder. Um, everyone has a uh, Q&A um, component in their GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and please feel free to ask questions at any time. They'll queue up and then we'll get to them uh, at the end of today's uh, discussion. Um, what I'm putting out on the screen uh, right now is our first poll question. Once again, I mentioned this earlier. This is for uh, folks who are getting CPE credit, but I'd love everyone to take this if you uh, want to give it 20 seconds to, to take a quick look. Um, and we'll actually revisit this. When we get into the Q&A section and uh, look at what people are thinking about. We've got a pretty good crowd today, so it'll be nice to, to see the results here. Um, a quick note, uh, everyone here will get a link to the soft copy of today's presentation. It's actually, the presentation is actually already out on Performative. We'll email uh, you out a link, um, and therefore it's just one click away uh, from you. So um, everyone will get that soft copy. We're going to give it a few more seconds, and then we'll close down this poll and continue going with our next speaker. Uh, so I'll just uh, give it an even minute, which is right now. I'll close the poll down. 
Thank you very much, everyone, for taking a moment to do that. And that brings us to our next speaker, David Morrison. Uh, David is uh, currently uh, the Director of Financial Planning and the Treasurer for the Port of Tacoma, uh, which positions he has held for the past six years. Prior to joining the port, David spent seven years at Intel and two years at Microsoft uh, in various finance positions. David has an MBA and a Master's of Manufacturing Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. And with that, David, I'd love to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So today, I will be just a quick uh, overview of the Port of Tacoma and uh, what our budgeting and planning tool history has been. And then I'm going to talk about four common uh, challenges in budgeting and how we've addressed them. And, and some of them, you could have philosophical discussions about different ways to, for example, to talk about fixed cost allocation or not to allocate. But we're just going to talk about our methodology and what we've used and and some of the challenges we've had in that. So let me give you an overview of the Port of Tacoma. Uh, we were founded in 1918. We're about the eighth largest international port in the U.S. with five international terminals. Um, primary partner uh, uh, is China. We are also known as the gateway to Alaska, where most of the uh, products heading up to Alaska, Anchorage, come through the Port of Tacoma and through our partners. Our 2011 financials, we had revenue of about $114 million with net income of $21 million. And being a capital-intensive um, industry, we have about $650 million of debt, both uh, general obligation bonds and revenue bonds. What's a little bit unique about the Port of Tacoma is we are both an operating and a landlord port. Uh, a lot of ports are just landlords, but we, we do operate um, uh, a break bulk facility and intermodal yard. So I'm here to talk about the tools we've used and, and how we've upgraded to improve uh, and address some of our challenges. When I joined in 2005, we were on an older version of Profix, and um, it was mainly used by the budgeting staff, no integration to our general ledger. Um, really, the departmental budgeting uh, was used uh, just for by department owners using Profix, but the revenue and expenses was done by the budgeting team on Excel spreadsheets, and uh, and we would then have to load into Profix because the equations for revenue and and what I call cost of goods sold or related expenses were were complex. We've upgraded to uh, a, a later version of Profix in 2011, and some of the advantages we've seen and and. Uh, and enjoying are the integration to the general ledger so that budget can be easily transferred into the general ledger system and actuals can easily be transferred back out to the budgeting system and uh, for, for analysis. And we're using this for planning and forecasting uh, using drivers and I'll talk about some of the enhanced capabilities we've, we've used. So for most budgeting teams, I would think, there are challenges dealing with your fixed costs. And the port has what I call fixed or semi-variable expenses tied to basically 100% variable revenue. An example here is we have a unionized maintenance staff for maintaining the equipment that takes containers off, off ships and puts them onto trains. And you always have an overhead uh, allocation or an overhead for that uh, service. So an impact to profit margin, as you allocate that cost out, it can make one product line look more or less profitable just based on an allocation. And what happened is prior to the pro uh, Profix upgrade, we had to use multiple spreadsheets with manual drivers. And any time the cargo forecast would change, which if people are involved in budgeting, as you know, the, the forecast seems to change to the very last minute before the presentation to the board, it would require significant rework. With the upgrade, we've been able to automate the allocation of costs based on volume drivers. And so I can take a, a, a cargo survey or a cargo forecast, quickly put it into the tool. It will go in, recalculate my revenue, and then come back with a proposed allocation for uh, variable ex or for our fixed expenses. So it, the automation has saved probably mm, eight hours of work per cycle time 
And so we, we've certainly enjoyed that, that saving. Another important um, part of our budgeting process is depreciation. The port's depreciation is approximately $30 million a year. In the last couple, three or four years, we've had uh, new uh, major capital uh, uh, projects come online. So we've had 2 to $5 million in capital earned depreciation being added in the year. Uh, obviously, that's not sustainable over the long term. We're seeing that trend down. But to get a, a good forecast going out into depreciation expenses, uh, what we used to have to do was we'd use our existing fixed asset depreciation from the general ledger. We would um, have to load that into the budget tool and use Excel to calculate the uh, depreciation for new projects that start uh, in the current year and in forward years. Now what we've been able to do is put a capital budget and depreciation calculation all within one tool into the profits tool. And so when we finalize our capitalized uh, our capital budget, depreciation is automatically calculated for the new projects and loaded into the budget and or forecast. So again, significant savings in terms of calculating uh, depreciation. The third area where we've, we've seen some significant cycle time improvements is dealing with what I would call conditional revenue modeling. So uh, I mentioned we are an operating port, so we have uh, revenue from cranes and, and uh, equipment that puts the containers onto trains and takes it to the Midwest and the East Coast. And from a revenue perspective, we have required minimums. So at low volumes, uh, if, if customers don't ship enough products, they will pay a minimum. At high volumes, they get a discount, and it can be a step discount between the minimums and the, and the higher volumes. And we have mid-year escalations in rates, usually uh, by CPI, but it can vary. So in terms of automation, prior to the upgrade, we had separate spreadsheets for each business and, and had to make sure the, uh, the, the, the CPI increases were in sync, that the uh, contractual minimums and or discounts were in uh, the Excel models and updated. Post-upgrade, we've been able to automate the calculation in the system. So we, what we've done is centralized assumptions for CPI, making sure they flow evenly to all the different models. We've uh, automated the minimum payments, and the minimums change from year to year. It can be one amount in the fir first year and increase by 10 or 15 percent the next, and, and so on, and also automate volume discounts. So as the cargo forecast changes, either during a budget process or a forecasting process, we can uh, reflect what that what that does to our revenue and play scenarios. We can make scenarios. The final area where we've seen um, significant improvements is dealing with personnel. And personnel cost for the port is about a third of our expenses and about a $30 million cost. And we have multiple categories of staff and they all have different salary increases with different timings and different percentage increases with labor contracts, non-union, uh, temp temporaries, um, project workers, and then full-time equivalents. And then each of those groups have different benefits, and we do a five-year forecast. So there's a lot of variables that we have when, when addressing really what is uh, a major cost to the port. So what used to have to happen is a very detailed spreadsheet for a one-year budget, and then we would build on top of the first-year budget, the second-year budget, and then the third, fourth, fifth. And any change to the first-year budget where we thought we would add or subtract headcount or change the assumptions about uh, percentage increases or changes would have to cascade, and you would have to reforecast all five years. Uh, what I've enjoyed significantly is being able to have one five-year budget where any changes in any time, so a, a change in assumption in the third year will automatically flow to the fourth or fifth, and obviously a change in the first year will flow to the first, uh, the remaining four years. So the point being, um, the automation of some of these key areas that go into the budget significantly save 
uh, at least my team, budgeting effort, they improve, improve accuracy and control. With that, I'm done. Fantastic. Thank you very much. All right, so we've got a lot of time for questions, which is great. We've got a bunch of uh, questions piling up here, so we're, we love to see that. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, uh, let folks continue to, uh, to add their questions here as we go. Uh, we do have our second polling question, which I'll open up right now. And on the far end of this polling question, we'll, we'll start tackling some of these questions. Um, so folks can take uh, a few moments to answer this. That would be great. <clears throat> And once again, even if you're not here for CPE credit, it would be great if you would uh, take the polling question so we can see what folks are, uh, are interested in uh, and when it comes to uh, what their companies are prioritizing. <clears throat> we'll leave it open for another 20 seconds or so. And once again, if you want to ask questions of either of today's speakers, go to the question area in your GoToWebinar control panel and uh, just tap out a question. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and close down the poll. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll get into our panel discussion. Um, so the first question I'm going to pose to Barry. Um, we had a great overview of uh, the budgeting process. Um, we didn't dive too far down, I know, given the time constraints. But this first question actually is a bit of a dive down, um, or at least a first step, which is if you're looking to retool your budgeting uh, process, which I, I guess in this context maybe contains people, process, and technology, where do you start? Um, so I think, I think that um, there are a number, a number of, of things to do. You know, one is to go through the workflows and, and to review what you did before. And to, even to take a poll to say, do you, you know, what worked and what didn't work? At least you get some sense of the mechanics of it. Um, two is is to really go through and, and understand whether or not your budget process was goal centered. You know, is is the budget process as you retool changing the company? Uh, you know, there are certain things you, you need to do to keep the lights on for sure. But at the end of the day, the allocation uh, and you know, I think as you saw in the other presentation, quite rightly. You know, managing depreciation, managing assets, managing people are, are all relevant um, to the company. And, and are you, in fact, you know, going through um, that level of change to to get manager involvement? Number three, I think, is uh, teaming and accountability and to retool based on are we putting the right people on the budget process? Are we creating the right budgets? Do we have the right review process? Does it matter? Uh, is it tangible? And then, and then number four is, um, is software. Yeah. So the retooling, uh, are we doing just Excel right now? Uh, do we have, you know, the right, the right software to do budgeting? And, you know, and I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, I call from 20 to 3 to 1, make a great big long list, don't spend a whole lot of time on it, get down to your, your semifinalists, and then you know, go through a rigorous process to pick a winner. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of case studies. I, I, I like to read, as an analyst, um, how Company X was successful, you know, doing Y process and budgeting with, with Profix or, or whatever software package. And I think the combination of these four things should put you in good stead. John? Great. And, and David, when you guys were embarking on this process, did you um – uh, how did you break it down? Did you follow a um, process like that? Did you look back before you looked forward? We did. When One of our goals in improving the process and improving our tool was to drive more ownership. As I mentioned in my presentation, from 2005 until 2011 with the tool, it was much more a budget team effort and, and, and very little involvement with department owners and or P&L owners. And, with a new tool, we've been able to very much more engage the, the departmental departmental owners and the P and L owners. And and what I would comment with Barry is one of the most important things in doing budgeting 
is to make sure you have from executive management the top-down goals and directions uh, before you start the budgeting process. Uh, I'm sure many of the people online who are on the phone have started a budget process, they're reaching conclusion, uh, a conclusion and then management wants to change the direction and, and in fact knew that they wanted to change and never communicated. So having those top goal, top-down goals and directions before you start the process is one of the things that we work on hard here at the court. And I'd like to actually play on um, one thing that you just mentioned, which was um, you talked about the importance of uh, getting buy-in from your operational partners. How do you do that, so especially at big companies where things are reasonably distributed? For departmental owners uh, to, to get their buy-in, they are really own the data and are held responsible for documenting what they're budgeting for their travel, for their training, uh, their expectations for staffing, and, uh, and um, similar, similar type expenses. So really giving them an opportunity and a tool to be involved uh, has helped. Uh, it's harder on the P&L side where expenses are, are driven by um, uh, it's harder to get people involved in the expenses, but holding the, the, the business managers responsible for revenue forecasts and again going through and helping them understand the model uh, really drives the ownership. And what was it about um, the platform that made it easier to, to sort of push um, participation down to uh, the operating units? <laughs> One thing um, that has very much helped us drive ownership is the ability to look at actuals and drill down into actuals on the same system you're doing your budgeting on. And that should be, a, I, I would recommend a requirement for anyone looking at a new budgeting tool. How often times do you sit down to do the budget and you got a piece of paper printed out from your, your uh, general ledger system and then you've got to go into contract system to find any details and then you're trying to budget on Excel or some other tool. What's really worked for us is the ability on the same screen to have prior year actuals on the same screen with a budgeting, budgeting uh, uh, period and be able to say, oh, what happened last August that where we spent $500,000 being able to drill into that and say, oh, yes, that's an annual expense. Uh, that we expect to occur this next year in the budget, and then being able, sh you know, to put it into the budget. So I think having budget and actuals together in the same tool really helps drive uh, ownership and a better f budgeting process. That's a great piece of insight, Barry. Do you, uh, when you're counseling companies, do you? Um, I mean, is, this, is that high on the checklist? Making sure that the uh, budgeting forecasting tools they're using are. are um, uh, pre-integrated in some way, shape, or form with their accounting systems? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, there's no other way to go. And so part of the, of the checklist is to, is to ensure that there is a level of interoperability, that I have the ability to put data out of one and into, into the other. It doesn't need to be, you know, the most sophisticated middleware. It doesn't need to be real time, mm -hmm. but it does need to be agile that I can, I can get the data from one to the other, but yes, absolutely. And um, do you find that uh, your clients are uh, using um, ISVs um, more frequently to go through this process, the selection process, and then the implementation process, or do people tend to uh, work with the uh, platform providers themselves um, during implementation? And do selection uh, you know, it's, more it's, on their own. Right. Um, it's all over the lot. I mean, certain certain clients hold their own. You know, many of them. You know, we're we're a small analyst firm, and there are larger firms around, like where I came from. And then so many many people will work with their analyst firm. You know, read the research and then work interactively through queries with them to to help through the process. I think they're. Um, so it's either uh, working with um, an outside consulting firm, probably it's, you know one targeting this area, uh, working with a research firm like ours or others, uh, or rolling your own. Those seem to be the three most popular choices. Gotcha. Great. 
Another question for you, Barry, um, and this is one of my favorite all-time questions for a rolling forecast. Uh, how do you manage annual bonuses and annual variable compensation, let's say, um, when you are working with a rolling forecast model? So where does the budget end and the forecast begin in terms of compensation? That always seems to be one of the stickier issues. Well, is that for me? Um, so that's, that's for you, Barry. Yeah. Uh, very carefully, I think. You know, so uh, one way to do that is, is to have uh, incentives that are annual, but also incentives that are quarterly. And, and you can manage the incentive process, I think, you know, to your advantage uh, to do both. And obviously, if, if you're going to allow for agility and change, then you need to find a way to reward and send people to take risks and to engage in that change. And therefore, the overall um, incentive process, which I'm a big fan of, has both a, maybe should have a general corporate component, but also um, a quarterly centered set of components that reward the behavior of departments that can follow the goals and, and, and participate in them on a, on a you know, less, less periodic basis, known as quarterly rather than annually, to pull the whole thing together. So I'd say it's both short-term incentives, quarterly incentives, uh, and annual put together. Gotcha. OK, great. Um, David, is the port on a rolling forecast by any chance? Not a rolling forecast. We do a mid-year update. Um, our normal budget cycle is we, we budget current year plus four years out. So we do a five-year fo budget forecast and then mid-year's update. And the update is obviously informed by the, the five or six months of actuals we have for the current year. And our, um, just out of curiosity, and certainly don't say anything that you're not allowed to say, but um, have you guys tackled this issue of, and how have you tackled it, um, of uh, incentives based on budget versus a forecast that would change mid-year? The port is in the process of implementing a pay for performance. And so I, I don't have experience here at the port. At, at, at prior employers, Usually, the the incentives were based on an original budget, and only in extreme conditions uh, were changes made where a board approval would have to be gained to say, well, you didn't meet your goals, but because of significant uh, variations in in the economy or or in events that that uh, if, even if you didn't meet your goals, that you'll you'll get a bonus of some sort. But no, I, well, my experience has always been annual based. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a moment here and share um, the poll results that we saw earlier. I just popped the first one up on the screen. Um, and Barry, I'd, I'd love your take on this. The question here is which of the following is the highest priority uh, area for improvement at your company? And this is mm -hmm. presuming that virtually everyone on the phone here is in finance accounting or some related area. Right. Um, and Analysis number one. Um, we've got a slight majority there, and then budgeting and reporting. What do, what do you think about this? And does this uh, kind of fit in with what you see at um, you know client companies that you work with? I, I think so. Um, you know, it, although although I must say that to me, analysis and, and, and budgeting analysis and, and um, strategy are, are are pretty tied together, but. But I, I think uh, I kind of I like this observation, and and I think that you know the work that we've seen is you know if people can construct you know the right KPIs and, and dashboards and scorecards and graphics um, that drive the financial plan and, and drive the business. Um, I think that's you know I think that's a good thing. I, I would say that that I would also want to borrow part of number two and, and, and critical reporting, particularly the ability, you know, to to disaggregate the numbers, peel the onion in, in a way that is elegant and then supported by graphics uh, makes it all come together. But I, I think it's mm -hmm. fine. Thank you. Uh, David, any comments on this? Um, is analysis the winner at, at your port as well? Uh, I certainly would love to have more analysis capabilities. It's the challenge of getting data collection and then um, and, and then having the right sense of, 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 of data so we can get information. And that's, that's our challenges in our industry, collecting all um, information is challenging because we have a very uh, segregated 
um, industry between the shipping lines and the people working on the dock and the railroad. So uh, having analysis would be key. It's just getting the data to make it useful. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, quick question for David. How long was the transition time um, from your legacy system to your current system? It was about a five-week process uh, in terms of once the actual consulting got started. Um, and we were on a fairly tight, tight time frame. So we had a consultant come out, work, uh, work with us for a couple weeks. Uh, they left for a period of time, a week or two, to allow us time to work on the system, learn it, uh, get educated on it, and then they came back for a week. And that way we could ask better questions having learned the system and having to have flown on our own, so to speak. It was an upgrade, so we were already familiar with the, the basic workings of the system. I would expect uh, probably a longer transition if it was a completely new system, but for us it was a very smooth and, and relatively quick process. Gotcha. Uh, okay, next question. Um, uh, and this one is to Barry. Can you talk briefly about using burdened rates for personnel budgeting? Uh, a lot of companies, I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of, of um, discussion around how you burden, whether you burden um, is it the oh. people, it's the materials, et cetera. Um, where do you fall on this, and what advice would you have for folks who are dealing with uh, budgeting issues? Uh, well, you know, I'm going to push that to David, because I think he can do a much better job than me on this question. We do not use burden rates. Uh, in prior employers, we did, um, because they were much, much, much bigger companies. Um, at the port, uh, we have relatively small number of people, 230 uh, odd people of those budgeters, maybe 100. And so we don't use burden rates. People are actually out budgeting specifics for travel and training. And, and that drives some of the ownership. With our tool, we're able to capture uh, details of, say, everyone's tra tra travel or training plan and then able to look at it in aggregate. So for a smaller organization, we don't use a burden rate, gotcha. if I understand the question correctly. Ah, but that sounds like you did. Um, there's, uh, uh, and I can't remember, uh, I think it was Barry who mentioned this, and we have a question related to something that uh, Barry brought up, and I'll ask for both of your opinions here. Top down versus bottom up, uh, and that's the classic budgeting conundrum. Um, you can use all the drivers in the world and, and uh, accuracy down to the eighth decimal, and then you know the VP of uh, something or other just drops a bomb on your plan, or the CEO uh, decides to change the plan. Um, is there a how do you get a good balance between uh, top down, bottom up? Is it completely dependent on? companies place and time on their industry, et cetera. Barry, I'd like uh, your take yep. on that first. Um, well, I think you have to do both. And I think you need to sort of top down and set goals, um, assign accountability at the executive or departmental level, and continue to disaggregate uh, down maybe another two levels or three uh, until you get to a point where the rubber meets the road and, and you can have folks who can actually uh, be responsible, put in budget numbers. Then it goes back the other way and it goes bottom up and then gets analyzed on, on a more aggregate basis and then perhaps gets pushed down again. But I don't believe you can do a successful budget cycle unless you can start out top down and then go bottom up to get to where you need to be. Interesting. David, what's your take on that? I think management has to set the original expectations for departments and then let departments go from a bottoms up or for things that are fixed or semi-variable go from a bottoms up once expectations are somewhat communicated. I think tops down for, for revenue uh, helps uh, because they have plans or thoughts about the industry uh, and where they want to go and what they expect. And, and once you have a tops down view of, of that revenue, you can go look at the drivers get that done and then look and see if really the profitability forecast makes sense. So uh, with Barry, it's a mix, and I think you have to treat departments different than business lines. Okay. Great. Um, we have a reasonably specific question, but I want to broaden it out a little bit. Um, the questioner asks, any tips for budgeting or forecasting in a franchise-based uh, franchise business? Um, but actually, to, to Barry, a little twist on that is, 
uh, and, and this is speaking as someone who's been in, in uh, a CFO at four different industries worth of companies, um, is there much difference in your approach to budgeting from industry to industry? Oh, yes. Um, I think you know, if you listen to, you know, to David's talk, then, then uh, what, what he does is you know, a lot different than a hospital or an accounting firm. And, and therefore, you know, one of the things that, that I like to look at, and I'm actually beginning to write some research uh, on this, which may take a, a while to go through industries, that um, the budgeting approach, you know, and the drivers for, for healthcare and patients and Medicare-related things is way different than the Port of Tacoma and, and, and the nature of that particular business. And so... I think that um, understanding um, the templates, the vertical components therein, and you know, talking to the vendors and say, "Gee, do you get this?" You know, and now that I'm, you know, I'm starting it, I had one vendor today who said, "Okay, uh, I see. I, so I want to do public sector." I said, "Okay, let's talk about that. Um, that they they are they are sure they all have you know capital. I'm sure they all have people. <clears throat> I'm sure they all have travel, but." Um, they're, they're just so different. If you're an you know, asset intensive business, you know you're way different than a professional services firm, and need to understand that and budget accordingly. I'd so, say. would your process, your approach, still be similar? You know, look at what you're doing, look at your business models, what's your, what are your drivers, etc. Or would that vary industry to industry as well? No, I think the approach is, is entirely similar, and, and and I'd love to get David's take on it as well. I, I think it's a matter of you know the drivers are different. You know, and if you're if you're a mine, if you're in the mining industry, then you have a huge amount of capital equipment, and and so does David in his area, and, and you just don't have that if you're you know a financial services firm, you just don't. But once you understand the drivers and, and can 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 hone in on the you know 10, 20, 40 variables that, that make a difference, you're it's the same game, top down and bottom up. But the verticalization, and I, I would urge the audience to, looking for software, you know, make sure that, that your uh, software vendor that's looking at understands your vertical and, and has case studies that, that you can, that, that are real, and that, that show and understand that vertical. David, what, what do you think? I, I think you spoke eloquently, Barry. I, I would agree. I think the process is very similar, setting goals, uh, getting input, and, and that each business, uh, each business segment is just different and you're going to have to focus on different areas. Obviously, in a capital intensive, it's the, the capital purchases and depreciation is a huge function, quite different from a labor intensive industry. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, an interesting question here. Um, I'll, I'll start with David on this one. Um, uh, does it matter whether you have a CPA or not in terms of your ability to create a good budget or forecast? Well, I'm biased because I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so maybe I, I'm, uh, I did not come from an accounting background. I came from an engineering background. And, and I think the, the, any field where you go through logic and um, uh, mathematics, so to speak, helps you in budgeting. So. I, I think I've been successful without a CPA in my role, and I'm, but I'm sure others have their opinions. Uh, Barry, do you see any difference, any meaningful difference in approach, um, in execution? No. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with David. I, I just chuckle about it. But I, I always like to you know, look at four people, and if, if they think that the fact that a balance sheet balances every year is a trend, I know they're not the right people for my budgeting stuff. Yeah. I agree. You just, you just need to know some basic. You need to be logical. You need to have a. a, a, a you need to have a joy of, of finance. You need to like this stuff. It's complicated and it's very detailed, and that's really all that matters. And I think if you're a CPA, that's fine. You don't need. To. Um, when it comes, uh, Barry, to picking the right drivers for your business. Um, what sort of uh, analytical approach would you recommend for companies so that they're analyzing the right things and at the end of the day coming up with the right drivers? Right. So uh, I, I, you can even do this in Excel um, uh, if you want, but uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very straightforward financial simulation. It says 
um, what does my company do? What are the revenues? What are the costs? And and what moves them? You know, so so if a company um, over the years has moved ten percent or thirty percent because something happened, well, whatever made that happen is a driver, and, and and you can pretty much model what the key drivers are. And so I would start out and talk to the executive team about you know what ifs and simulations and back of the envelope and, and if a change by twenty percent, do you care? And that will teach you very quickly what the drivers are. Great. One um, one final question here, and uh, we'll go with David first. Uh, how does one enlist management in this process um, if they happen to be a little disconnected from it? Uh, I have found myself in that situation, and um, I am a strong believer in pay for performance and compensation, and that's a very simple answer, but I think you get motivation uh, and buy-in from from executive management if they can see um, the impacts some of it to themselves for the performance of the organization, and that's based on prior prior employers. So I think um, you know that's the most basic of ways of of getting people motivated. I think um, the other way to get management I involved is is talking about um, their ability to lead the group and and their ability to set the people are looking to them to lead and and that will um, oftentimes you know, putting it in how they appear will help um, help drive involvement. Gotcha, Barry. Anything to add to that? Well, I think that's exactly right. And and the other the other thing that you can do is that top management is, is, is somehow, you know, uninvolved, not involved enough, is go down a level and, and, and get your, you know, your second level managers, your division leaders to push it up and just just um, almost read the riot act to the CEO saying, you know, we can't run a company like this. And if we can't get the CEO to get it, we can get maybe his or her direct reports to get it uh, and push it up. It, it, it's, it's so uh, much of a disincentive for management not to drive it, for middle management not to give people attaboys uh, to feel good about hard work that, that, that they want to do, that it's either got to be if the CEO or the top, or the top management doesn't get it, then it's incumbent on the line management below them to make sure they do. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, I would love to thank both Barry and David for their time and insight today. Uh, if you would like us to connect you, if you're on this webinar, would you like us to connect you with either of today's speakers, please indicate that on the survey. Um, that will pop up as soon as we close down this webinar. Uh, so there will be a survey as soon as we uh, close things down today. We'd appreciate your taking uh, just a minute or two to go ahead and, and answer those questions. Uh, we'd love to know how we can do better the next time, uh, where we met or did not meet your expectations. And uh, once again, if you'd like to connect to today's speakers, uh, it's just a click away. Um, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Profix. Um, we appreciate that uh, they and all the sponsors of Performative allow us to put on educational events like this and, in fact, provide Performative online at no cost to our users. If you have any questions about CPE credits, uh, you'll see Tanya Walsh's email at the bottom of this slide I'm just bringing up right now. And uh, feel free to email her directly, and she will get you taken care of forthwith. And with that, uh, finally, I'd like to thank everyone who attended today. Thank you for your time. We realize how busy you all are, and uh, we appreciate you joining us here today. And we look forward to seeing you again at another event or at uh, performative.com online. So I will now end today's webinar, and you'll be presented with that quick survey. We'd love it if you would take a moment uh, to complete that, and we'll see you next time. Have a great week, everyone. Take care.